So I'm going to do part two of the message I started last week when we talked about what to do with the new, how to handle new things in our lives. You know, God brings new things our way. Each one of us, he gives us new things. He gives us his presence, his mercies are new every day. He gives us words of prophecy. He gives us an assurance of his word. He gives us new relationships. God is constantly bringing new things into our lives. The challenge is, what do we do with them? And how do we handle our lives in such a way that we don't lose the new things that God is bringing our way? I believe that in the last month and the previous month, in June and July, our God has done great things in our lives and new things are poured into our lives and we have to learn how to keep them and work with them. So that's what we're going to be doing as I do part two of my message, Working with the New. And I'll go back to Luke's Gospel, chapter number five, and uh, go to verse 37 and verse 38. Luke chapter five, verse 37 and 38. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will bust the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Let me just start of, of right from the onset to say that Jesus is not teaching about wines. He's not teaching about uh, nice wines and, and how to drink wine. Uh, Jesus is using wines and wineskins as analogy, as a metaphor to teach about the spiritual life. And so he's using uh, what is natural to teach what is spiritual. It's always important to put the teachings of Jesus into context. And this is a parable, so it's an analogy. And uh, if you want to know about wine, there will be another time for me to teach on that. But this time we're using this from a parable's point of view in the teaching of the lesson. So Jesus is talking about new wine and wine skins, old wine skins. So the first thing he talks about is new wine. A new wine there talks about the fresh juice of the grape. When the grape plant uh, is harvested, it's squeezed, and the fresh juice, that's what the Bible calls the new wine. It's unfermented, it's new, and it's fresh, it's new, it's lively, and it is something that is bubbly. So it represents a new content, fresh content, lively content, something you receive that is new. It's like a new word of prophecy, a new word of assurance, or something new that comes into your life. But in this instance, Jesus is using new wine to describe his teaching. The teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ is new wine. It's fresh, it's lively, it's changing lives. It's good. Remember the background to the story is that the Pharisees had come to ask Jesus about why his disciples did not fast. And Jesus is answering the question. And so he's, he is contrasting his ministry, his word, his life with that of the Pharisees. And he calls his the new wine. It's fresh, it's lively, it's sweet, and it's a blessing. That is the teaching of Jesus Christ. Then he talks about old wine skins, old wine skins. Old wine skins are normally stiff and dry containers. Wine skins were used to contain wine. They are like bottles in our day, but they were not bottles, they were just goat skin that was used for preservation of wine. And Jesus uh, is, is using this to describe the way of the Pharisees. And he calls their ministry or their understanding old wine skin. In other words, old stiff 
containers. So the old wine skin represents old mindsets and old traditions. So just from the onset, Jesus is saying, my new life, my new way, my new thought cannot be contained in your old mindset, in your old traditional point of view. If you're going to receive what I have for you, then something has to happen to the container, the way you receive what I have for you. And the reason why Jesus says that is because old wine skins do not stretch. They do not stretch. They, and, and, the, and the background to this is in the making of wine, when the grape is harvested, there is a new wine. It is put into a fresh wine skin. And then it ferments. And in the process of fermentation, uh, the sugar is broken down. There's a release of a lot of gases. And so there is expansion of volume. So if the wine skin doesn't expand, then it's going to ruin the wine. So that's what Jesus is talking about. It's similar to uh, being pregnant. You, you, you have a mother who gets pregnant and she's excited. New life has started inside of her. But that new life is not going to stay. That new life is going to grow. So the womb must grow and the internal organs will be displaced and the abdomen area has to grow. If that does not expand to accommodate this new child, then the child will not reach full term, uh, probably die and maybe jeopardize the life of the mother. So Jesus says that if New wine is put into old wine skin. If something new is forced into an old system, he says two things will happen. First, there will be wastage. He says the new wine will be lost. The new will be lost. It will be spilled. So something that is started as new is going to be lost because we put it in the wrong system. And the second thing he says will happen is that it will be destroyed. The old Wine skin itself, the old system itself, will be ruined. Jesus said that the wine skin will be ruined. So there are important lessons that Jesus wants us to learn. And there are lessons that we can apply to our lives. We can apply to different areas of our lives. We can apply to our Christian walk with God. We can apply to our marriages. We can apply even to businesses and how we run them. It's always important that when God gives us something new, we are able to keep that new thing. So two lessons, main lessons that I want to talk about. The first is that when God does a new thing in my life, I must stretch my life to accommodate it. If God does a new thing in my life, I must stretch my life to accommodate it. It's just like the mother and the baby. It's great to be pregnant. But if your system cannot stretch, then what brought you joy may bring you a lot of sadness. That is a practical lesson. When God gives me something new, when God brings something new into my life, it puts responsibility on me to be able to have the capacity to hold it together so that I don't lose what God has blessed me with. It could be the blessing of a new job. It could be the blessing of a new relationship. It could be a blessing of new information. It could be a blessing of an impartation of an anointing. Whenever God imparts something new into your life, there's going to be adjustment. The new thing will not manifest itself to the fullest if we don't make adjustments to accommodate it so it has full expression in our lives. That is the first lesson that we learn from this passage that Jesus is teaching. The second thing is that if I refuse to change the structure of my life, I will lose the good things God brings my way. If I refuse to change the structure of my life, 
I will lose the good things God brings my way. Jesus was God in the flesh with us. Jesus was the answer of the prayer of the Jews. For a redeemer, Jesus is the solution to the problems of this world. But Jesus is not a solution just by himself. He's a solution when we also allow him room in our lives, into our hearts, into our ministries, into, into our society, and for the Jews of the days of Jesus. Although he's new and he's the new wine, they didn't make room for him. Pharisees couldn't handle him. Scribes couldn't handle him. Sadducees couldn't handle him. They couldn't. The Bible says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become sons of God. When he says his own didn't receive him, it doesn't mean they didn't tolerate him. It simply means that they didn't make room for him. They didn't expand to accommodate him. They didn't change their minds to accommodate him. So think about all the good things that God has done in your life. We think about ourselves as a church. God wants to do new things in our lives. He's given us a new auditorium. He's given us a new place to worship. He's given us opportunity to worship him. Do we have to make adjustments? Yes, we have to make adjustments. We have to do things differently. If a church wants to reach young people, a younger generation, it's not going to format its services just to appeal to an older generation. You know, when I was a younger pastor, uh, as you know, I started pastoring this church when I was quite young. I was uh, barely 25 years old. And when you are that young, you have 24, 25, you start a church and, and uh, you're pastoring a church and, 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 and all the people around you are about your age or younger, a few older. Uh, you, you want to attract older people. So you find that pretty soon your church service is being done to accommodate an older generation, which is good because God has done something to you. You have to expand it so it's not a youth church because if you're not careful, if you're 24 years old, your church will be a youth church. It will be like somebody's youth service and that's your full church. So you have to find out how do we accommodate uh, all the people God brings our way. So we have to do things differently. We have to be more structured and we have to start working with time. Young people don't care much about time. You can waste all their time and they'll be fine in church. But older people have better time management. So we became more time conscious and all of that. And all of that was done to accommodate a different kind of people from the people we started with. Now we want our church to accommodate a younger generation because I'm older, so I need to have younger people coming into church. And so as you can see in our church, so much is being done still to retain the older people, but also to get a new generation who feel comfortable and feel that this is a place I can belong to. That's why our praise team dress the way they dress. That's why they sing the songs they sing. That's why they do what they do. Why? Because God has given us something new and we are stretching. We are making room. We are trying to contain it in a new mindset, in a new container, in a new way. And that would advise the way we approach everything in our lives. When God brings something new in our lives, we have to stretch. We have to stretch. When God brings new people into our church, we have to stretch. We cannot say, well, you know, these are new people. They are visitors. They don't know our way. And, and so we, we make it difficult for them to assimilate in the church. No. If God brings new people in our way, we have to stretch. We have to be accommodating. We have to open our minds. We have to create space so that the new thing is preserved by the Lord. In essence, that is what Jesus is teaching. But I'm going to try to apply this principle to some areas of our lives. The first area I want to 
apply it, I've, I've said it a bit earlier, is our walk with God. When God gives us something new, our minds must be renewed to accommodate it. When God gives us something new, our minds, our minds are the wine skins. Our minds must be renewed to accommodate it. And so let's say a person is born again, gets born again, he receives new life in Christ. And the new life in Christ is the life of righteousness, of holiness, of faith, of, of, uh, of joy, of peace, and all of that. But this person traditionally is very fearful, so is very doubtful, is always worried, never cheerful, uh, and all of that. But the life they have received is a life of joy, of peace, of faith. Now, if they're going to live the life of joy, peace, and faith, and their natural mindset, culture, behavior is worry and doubt and self-doubt, then there's going to be a conflict between the life God has given to them and the way their mind, their wine skin works. And if their wine skin doesn't change, then although God has given them righteousness and peace and joy and victory and abundance, they're not going to enjoy it. The life that Christ gives to us when we get born again includes well-being, prosperity. Doesn't mean you're going to be the richest person in the world, but God wants to bless us. He wants our lives here on earth to be meaningful and worthwhile. But if you have a poverty mindset, then although God wants to bring abundance to you, your mind is going to shut it. Your mind is going to be like that new old wine skin. Prosperity is coming by. You say, oh, no, no, I'm poor. Our family is poor. My father is poor. Everybody is poor. My nation is poor. I'm a third world country. Now that is your wine skin. But God is pouring the wine of abundance, of prosperity, of favor, of increase. He's pouring it into you, but your mind is squashing it. Or maybe you, you, you are always talking very negative. I cannot do it. I'm not able. I don't have what it takes. That's your mindset. That's your wine skin. And God says, you are well able. I am with you. You are more than a conqueror. That is the new wine pouring. But if you don't accommodate, if you don't renew your mind, then this new thing that God is doing, being poured into your life every day, in church, in your Bible study, through the work of the Holy Spirit in you, all that God is pouring into your life will be wasted because your wine skin is stiff, is stuck, and cannot accommodate the new thing that God is doing. I believe with all my heart, without any shadow of doubt, that a Christian life is the most exciting life to live. It's a good life. It's a life of goodness, of blessing, of abundance, of joy, of overcoming. Even when it's dark, it is light. When we are in the valley, it brings us to the mountain. That's the Christian life. But that mindset, that new thing that God is doing, it has to be accommodated in the way we process our minds. So, when God brings new things our way, new blessing our way, new word our way, new instruction our way, our minds must be renewed to accommodate it. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove, you can taste, you can experience what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. In other words, if my mind is not renewed, if my wine skin doesn't expand, I cannot taste, prove, I cannot enjoy the good and the perfect and the will of God. I can't. I can't. Although God has given it to me, my wine skin is going to spill it and it's going to destroy it. That's what Jesus is teaching. 
I brought new life. But you have to adjust to accommodate it. Otherwise, it's of no benefit, no blessing to you. So that is the first application of this principle. Second application, we can apply it to our marriages. Isn't it good? Whether you're married or not married, you can benefit from this. When God brings a new partner into our lives, we must stretch our lives to accommodate them. <clears throat> One of the challenges of marriage is that we all start life as single people. We were single, and we lived our own life on our own terms in our own time. Now, that's fine. If, if you want to continue doing that, don't, don't bring anybody into your space. Just enjoy life on your own terms. But the day your heartbeat changes, and you start having fluttering of heart, fluttering, your heart is going boop, 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 boop. And you fall in love with somebody. And you welcome the person and you decide that you're going to build a life together with that person. God has brought somebody new into your life. And you can't live a single life again. I like how Adam responded when Eve came. He says, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she's taking out of me. Eve was the new wine for Adam, the new person. The new person that God brought to him. He was actually asleep. And this woman comes and she says, I need to accommodate this woman. And how do I know she accommodated the woman? Because when Eve had a bad experience with the devil and got both of them into trouble. Adam says to God, part complaining, part affirming, the woman you gave me. In other words, Lord, I truly accommodated this woman into my life because you gave her to me. So even when our lives have gone bad, I still believe you gave her to me and he still stuck with her for many years afterwards. When God brings somebody new into your life, it's like new wine. You remember when you first fell in love and you thought you couldn't live a day without a person. So how come now you think you don't want to live with a person? Because the wine skin is not stretching. There are areas that you are keeping away from each other. And as a result, there is a spillage taking place. A wineskin is a mindset. It has to change. It has to be adjusted. You cannot live, want a Christian marriage and conduct it as an African traditional marriage. African traditional marriage, wineskin, cannot contain the wine of a Christian marriage. The Christian marriage is based on Christ, is based on the word of God, is based on, on how God wants us to show love. Not how Africans show love, how God wants us to do it. When God brings somebody new into your life, you need to make adjustments. I need to, you need to, we need to. If you want your marriage to work, this is simple marriage counseling. Expand, stretch, accommodate them, accommodate the other person and their worldview and their mindset and their idiosyncrasies and their habits and all of that and, and be able to accommodate them. When God brings somebody new into my life, I have to stretch to accommodate them. Thirdly, our way of life. We must live our new life through a new mindset and new ways of doing things. And that's what Jesus said in the parable. New wine must be poured into new wineskins. That's what Jesus said. If you want to preserve the wine and the wineskin, then both 
the new thing, the wine, and the container of the new thing must be on the same wavelength. New wine, new wine skins. Fresh understanding, fresh thinking, fresh cultural understanding, fresh mindset. And he says, if you do that, then both the wine and the wine skin will be preserved. Isn't that amazing? If I, I look at it at a wider level, you can apply it to national development. You can apply it to uh, so many areas of our lives where new things are coming. We attend seminars. We attend workshops. You know, Ghana is one of those countries where people like workshops. I don't know why we do, whether it's because of the files we collect or the TNT and the per diems or whatever, but we like workshops and seminars. And we do that always. And government officials are going somewhere. They're going to Prague and they're going to Helsinki and they're going to someplace to, to, to uh, get new wines, so, so to speak, to learn new things. And then they come and we don't see the new thing. So the, there's a missing link somewhere. The missing link probably is, yes, we take in all the new thing, but it doesn't change anything about the wine skin. We still want to do things the way we've been doing it. We're still rigid. We're still stuck. We're still committed to an old way of doing things, although we are learning new things. And these days, knowledge is in abundance. You can read it. You don't even need to travel to get it. But having something new does not mean you're going to be new. Learning something new doesn't mean you're going to be different. Because what makes you different is your ability to allow the new to be contained in a new system. So this morning, I just want each one of us to commit, not just to receive new things into our lives, to, but to make the necessary adjustments so that the new thing God has brought our way stays and benefits us and becomes a blessing to us. Let us pray. Just want everybody to just bow down your heads for a with me for a moment, and if you are here, and you say, Pastor, I want new life, and the real new life starts with the life of Christ, when Christ comes into our lives, and he changes our lives. But he doesn't just want to come into our lives, he wants us to also make room for him in our minds. Renewal of mind. And if you are here, and you want to be born again, and you want Jesus Christ to come into your heart, you want to have a new life in Christ Jesus. I just want you to do something very simple this morning. I want you to lift up your right hand wherever you are seated. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just lift up your right hand. Lift it up, lift it up. The ushers are going to give you something very soon with your hand lifted up, so lift it up so they can see you. And those of you who lifted up your hands, I want you to put your hand on your heart, on your chest. And I want us to pray this prayer together. The whole church is going to pray together. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I ask you, Father, save me from my sins. Make me a child of God. From today, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I give my spirit to him, my mind to him, and my body to him. Lord Jesus, take over my life and use it for your glory. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. If you truly pray that prayer and then I believe that God has touched your life. And from this day, you begin a new journey as a Christian. And the ushers are going to uh, help you uh, with the new forms. And if you receive them, please write down uh, your name, fill in the forms. Let us have it right after service so we can follow you up and help you to live the Christian life. You are about to experience the most exciting life ever possible. Let's celebrate the Lord, everybody. Mm -hmm.